Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Middletown Presbyterian Church. Am I? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> uh, some things to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, next Sunday, remember, we will be having a pancake breakfast following church uh, hosted by our youth. Uh, so make plans to hang out <clears throat> and join us for that because probably during the service you'll begin to smell the sausage cooking and uh, it will get your uh, juices flowing and uh, so just come right downstairs and join us for that. Um, also, let's see, is, oh wait, Don's behind me. We, we have Upward uh, starting. Don, would you like to just let us know what's coming up? Chris Benson, and uh, we'll get you a poster. We also have some yard signs at the back. If you're in a prominent location anywhere with your business or your, you know, where your home is in terms of the roads, uh, we'd love to give you a sign that um, further advertises it. So, uh, and then your great word of mouth uh, would, would be great. Uh, just talk it up with anybody you know and uh, bring out your kids and grandkids and uh, we'll have a great time. So. It's a great program. All right, so talk it up, put up posters, or put up a yard sign if you're in a, in a good location for that. Uh, also, a week from tomorrow, uh, Monday the 20th, uh, our Primetime Plus will be meeting uh, starting at noon in the chapel. Uh, come out and join us for that. Uh, I know one of the things, uh, they, they will be having a special um, sort of... Uh, Remembrance of Margaret Essef, uh, as she was one of the leaders of that program. Uh, so come out <coughs> and join us for that uh, a week from Monday. Uh, also, just a reminder, Saturday, October 25th, we are having a um, South Dakota thank you dinner. Uh, all of those of us who went on the, the trip to South Dakota uh, wanted to treat all of you who supported us uh, through your prayers and finances uh, to a, a special dinner. So come out and see slides and hear uh, some reports on uh, what we did in South Dakota. That's at 6 o'clock on the 25th. Uh, also a reminder, Sunday, November 2nd, uh, we're going to have a Be the Church Day. Rather than just coming and, uh, and having church, we're going to come and be the church. Uh, if you can get here by 9 o'clock, that would be great because that's when we're going to start. Uh, we're going to have a number of different um, mission opportunities going on at the church that you can take part in. Uh, hopefully by next week we'll, I'll have a list of those uh, that, that we can hand out to you uh, and perhaps you can decide ahead of time what you're going to, to uh, want to participate in. Uh, if you can't, like if, if you're riding the bus, you're welcome to just come at your regular time and kind of <clears throat> join in uh, activities already in progress. Uh, but if you can get here at 9, uh, we'll start at 9. At about 11.15, uh, we're going to gather here in the sanctuary uh, and share communion together. So uh, it will be a slightly different Sunday, but uh, come out uh, and, and join us for that. I think those are all of our announcements for this morning. Uh, so I'd invite you to stand together as we sing our gathering song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. The words on the insert in your bulletin. So please stand.
Please join me in the call to worship found on the insert of your bulletin. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. We, your people, the flock of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will be held for grace. Blessed be the Lord forever. You may be seated. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul reminds us that when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. And so let us come before God's throne of mercy and grace to confess our sins using the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Let us pray together. Forgive us our sins, O Lord. Forgive us the sins of our youth and the sins of our age. 
the sins of our soul and the sins of our body, our secret and our whispering sins, our shameless and our careless sins, the sins we have done to please ourselves and the sins we have done to please others. Forgive us the sins that we know and the sins that we don't know. Forgive them, O Lord. Forgive them all because of your amazing grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. I'd invite you to stand as we proclaim what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. Uh, if you need it, it is found in your bulletin. Let us together recite what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. And at the end of the day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. A reading today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 32, verses 1 through 5, and can be found, found on page 394 of your pew Bible. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. The word of the Lord.
Good morning. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this beautiful sunny Sunday morning, for this new opportunity to come together and to worship you. But Lord, if you are not present here among us, there really is no reason for us to gather. So we invite you to be present here among us. We invite you to pour out your Spirit upon us, that we might be opened to your Word, that we might be open to hearing from you this morning. Lord, come and meet us here. Share with us your Word, that we might allow you to transform our lives for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning, we continue our current series on remembering our reformation. And I reminded you last week, if, if you don't keep track of the church calendar, that the last Sunday in October is always Reformation Sunday, the Sunday that uh, we kind of remember and celebrate uh, the Protestant Reformation. And Reformation really is about reforming, reforming to the original mold, as it were. Now, if any of you are sports fans, then I want you for a minute to, to think about your favorite sports team. Now, let's just say that your favorite sports team gets completely decimated by their opponent. They are humiliated. They, it, it's a shutout. Uh, it was like they didn't even show up to play the game. At the press conference after the game, what is the coach of that team likely to say? Because it's usually always the same script. Well, this week, we are going to focus on the fundamentals. We're going to go back to the drawing board. We're going to relearn the basics of the game. If, if it's football, for instance, we're, we're going to focus this week on running and throwing and catching, and holding on to the ball, and tackling. We're going to have to relearn the game because evidently we have forgotten how to play. That is the idea of Reformation. That is really what, what happened in the Protestant Reformation and, and really needs to continue to happen today, that, that we go back to the basics, that we remember what the the basic building blocks of our faith are, and we kind of realign. Now, at the time of the, the historic Protestant Reformation, there were some things that had been occurring in the church. There were uh, some things that were essentially being taught. Uh, one would hope that maybe it was by accident that they were being taught, but essentially... There were some things about how to become right with God that were being taught or reinforced by the church. And the first thought, which really has, has stuck even to this day, is the idea that, well, we can become righteous. We can become right with God by, by doing the right things, by, by engaging in righteous activities. The, the good that we do can make us right before God. That was, that was one way that, that we could fix our relationship with God, was to do good deeds, to, to help other people, to be good people. But then there was another way that we could become righteous with God, and, and that was basically to, to purchase righteousness, to, to buy it literally. And... And the church began this concept of indulgences. And indulgences were essentially uh, get-out-of-jail-free cards that you could buy from the church. And so, essentially, you could go to your priest and you could say, now, listen, I, I, I have committed this sin. You would, you would confess to the priest, and the priest would then tell you how much you had to pay in order to be forgiven of that sin. So, you know, I lied to my mother. Oh, Okay, well, that's going to be five dollars, and and then you'll you'll be forgiven of that sin. Oh well, I committed adultery. Ooh, oh, 
that's going to cost you about $500. And you can make the check right out to the church. Now, it sounds funny to us, but if you have been to Europe, it was the selling of these indulgences that really, for the most part, financed the building of all of the great cathedrals in Europe. People could buy their way to righteousness. And, and it wasn't always just for yourself. Let's just say that, that your Uncle Eustace passed away, and you loved your Uncle Eustace. He was a great guy. He was fun to be with, but he did have his little issues. And when he died, you're not really sure if, if he was going to make it into heaven or not. And so you, you could go to the priest, and you could talk to the priest, and the priest would tell you how much it would cost to buy your Uncle Eustace out of purgatory and into heaven. So this was another possible way of, of getting righteous, is to purchase it. But then along came some, some men like Martin Luther, and Martin Luther was studying the, the books of Romans and the book of Galatians, and he discovered in, in studying these books that, that these concepts of, of doing good works or of buying indulgences, they, they weren't in here. They, they weren't biblical. And in fact, in reading these two books, he, he discovered this concept called grace. And so, one of the, the rallying cries of the Protestant Reformation was, grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone. And so, today, we're, if you hadn't noticed from the songs that we've been singing, we're going to be thinking a little bit about this concept of grace, which I think is perhaps one of the most important and most fundamental concepts of, of the Christian faith. And yet, I think it is also one of the most misunderstood concepts of the Christian faith. Now, to be fair, I think part of that is because really in, in human experience, we have nothing like grace. Grace is almost a foreign concept to our human experience. Our scripture for today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans towards the end of chapter 3, starting at verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by His blood, effective through faith. He did this to show His righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that He Himself is righteous and that He justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, I think to truly understand this concept of grace, we also have to understand the concept of sin and the concept of righteousness. Now, sin, sin basically is is anything that displeases God, any, anything that, that might upset or displease God. And so when we break His law, the law that He laid out for us clearly in His Word, when, when, we, when we break His law, that is sin. 
When we don't do those things which we know that we should do, those things that God calls us to do, well, that also is sin. Really, if there is anything, whether it is, is a behavior or a person or a thing that, that you cling to more than you cling to God, that probably is sin. Now, as I said, there are sins that we do, and then there are things that we don't do, that we should do, that are sin. But there are times when there are things that may be a sin for me that might not be a sin for you. Just as an example, we, we might take drinking. I, I think you would find it hard to find any basis in Scripture that, that drinking alcohol is a sin. Jesus himself drank wine. However, if, if you are not in control of your drinking, if it is in control of you rather than you of it, then for you that might be a sin because you just you lose control. So all of this is sin. Now, from our human perspective, we, we like to categorize sin. We like to think of, you know, there are those big headline sins, those, those things that we can all kind of agree, whoa, that's not good behavior. And then there are the sort of minor sins that they're not really all that bad. And we like to, to be able to look at those people who do the big sins and say, well, at least, at least I don't do that. But what we fail to remember, what we fail to realize is the basic biblical concept that the wages of sin is death. The wages of all sin is death. Regardless of how we categorize them, it doesn't matter when it comes to God. All sin is the same from God's vantage point. All sin separates us from God. And that really is what it's talking about when it says the wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from God. And all sin, whether it is big or little, separates us from God. Now, we don't really like to think about that. We really don't like to talk about sin because, you know, that's, that's messy stuff. And we don't want to think about that. We, we want to think about the passages about, you know, God is love. But it does matter. Because we cannot truly be in relationship with God if we are separated from God by our sin. Now, we like to think that we're basically good people. And, and the fact is, we, we're, not so, we're not so upset about sin when it's somebody else's sin. But with us, we, we know us, and we know those close to us, and we know that we're really well-intentioned. We're, we're nice people. We're good people. And so, really, the little mistakes that we make shouldn't, shouldn't be that big a deal. But I want you to think for a minute, because it's kind of like committing a crime, perhaps a minor crime, in the presence of a police officer, and, and a good police officer, a, a police officer who believes that he is called to protect and serve, to uphold the law. Now, you commit this crime right in his presence. He witnesses the whole thing. But we want to say, but, you know, it was just a little thing. I, I was only going 10 miles over the speed limit. I really, 
I was in a hurry. I, I was trying to get to the hospital to visit a sick friend. Well, if he is truly a just police officer, he's not going to fall for that. He's going to write you a ticket anyway. Now, if someone else had been speeding 10 miles and had cut you off in traffic, you would have thought, where is the police officer? Why doesn't somebody stop people like this? We notice it and, and we think it is right when other people get stopped, but we have plenty of excuses for why we needed to get there faster. But it really doesn't matter if everyone was allowed to do whatever they wanted, if everyone was allowed to just speed when they needed to get there faster, it would be chaos. And on some level we realize that. Because we realize that other people need to be stopped when they're doing the wrong thing. It's just we have a sort of different level of acceptance for ourselves and for those close to us. But with God, God cannot abide sin. God, God cannot allow sin to just go. If he is truly a holy and just God, he has to punish sin. Now, as, as nice as, as we all are, as, as much as we try to be good and to do the right things, the Bible is pretty clear. I mean, we just read in our passage for today that there really is no difference. There is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. His Word also tells us that none are righteous. No, not one. We are all sinners. That, that was what puts us all on the same level. We, we really cannot look at anyone else and say, well, I'm better than they are. Not in God's eyes. We are all sinners on the same, on the same level, separated from God by our sin. And under the old covenant, under the covenant of the Old Testament, when we committed sin, we could, rather than having to to be put to death ourselves for our sin. We talked a little bit about this last week with the blood of Christ. We, we could offer some animal in our place. But in a way, now if you look at the statistics in this country, most of us have credit card debt. So I'm thinking that is something that we can all relate to. Something that we at least have some concept of the idea of credit card debt. Credit cards were introduced and suddenly we all believed that we had money to spend. Just put it on the credit card. And so we accrue debt. Now, we accrue a certain amount of debt and then the credit card company tells us what our minimum monthly payment is on that debt. Now, if you know anything about credit cards, you know that if you just pay that minimum monthly payment, it is going to take you a very long time to pay off that debt. Now imagine if, if your credit card had no limit. You could just keep spending. And you keep spending and, and you keep paying the minimum payment each month. You will never be debt free. You will never pay that off. That's kind of like it is with sin. The sin credit card has no limit. We just keep spending. And under the old covenant, those animal sacrifices, those were like the minimum monthly payment. I mean, it was nice, but it was never going to catch up with the debt of sin that was owed. We weren't 
we were never going to be debt-free. This is where grace comes in. Because God came Himself. If, if really what we owed was our life, that's what the wages of sin is death. Therefore, the, the consequence for our sin is that, that we be put to death. But God came Himself and He took that penalty on Himself. So what, what does that mean? Well, first of all, that means that we don't have to pay the penalty. That, technically, that is called mercy. Mercy is that we don't get what we deserve. Mercy is that we don't get the punishment that we rightfully deserve. And so that is the beginning of grace, is that God has showed us mercy. Now, if you remember several weeks ago, I, I preached on uh, Jesus' parable of the unforgiving or the unmerciful servant. The servant who came in and he had an unpayable debt to his king. The king is about to throw him into prison for the rest of his life because it's essentially until he could pay the debt. Well, he's never going to pay that debt. And so he pleads for mercy, and the king shows him mercy. He says, I'm not sending you to jail. But, but in addition to that, in addition to just the mercy, I'm not sending you to jail, he also says, I am forgiving your debt. And that is the second part of grace, is that we are forgiven the debt. But here's the problem with that. From a human perspective, that doesn't completely compute. If, if you owe me money, a, a significant amount of money, and you can't pay me back, and, and so eventually I say, you know what? Don't worry about it. Just forget about it. I, I'm forgiving the debt. Well, that's nice. The debt is forgiven. You don't have to pay that debt. However, for the rest of our lives, you and I will both know that I forgave you that debt. You and I will both know that while I'm not expecting payment of that debt, you still owe me. Because I am still out that money. You didn't have to pay it back, but but you're really still in my debt. But see, with grace, not only are we forgiven, but Jesus came and paid the debt. He took the penalty. He, he died in our place. He died for us, so the debt is paid. It's not that it's just forgiven, it's taken care of, it's paid in full. It is no longer on the books. It's not hanging over our heads. It's gone. That's beyond our human comprehension. We, we never let go of things. But God came. He did not require us to pay. He had mercy on us. He forgave us the debt, and He paid the debt. That's pretty good right there. I mean, that is grace. But God does not even stop there. Just a few chapters later in Romans, chapter 8, it says, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit, the Spirit of God, bearing witness with our spirit that we are children 
of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with Him so that we may be glorified with Him. Think about that. It, it is our debt. We are the ones racking up sin. We are the ones who created the debt. But God steps in. And by grace, He, one, shows us mercy. He doesn't, he doesn't give us what we deserve. He does not give us the death that we deserve. He forgives us the entire debt and pays it Himself. But in addition to that, He adopts us as His children. He brings us into His family and makes us heirs of all that is His. In addition to being forgiven and set free, we are given access to all the resources of God Almighty in relationship, in a familial father-child relationship with our Creator. And remember that, that whole debt thing? Here's one that you will never get as a special option from your bank. Not only are we forgiven of everything that we have done, but Jesus' payment covers everything we will do. It covers all future debt. Now, understand it takes a little something on our side, which we'll talk more about next week. And we do have to come to God. We have to confess our sin. But we're forgiven by God's amazing grace. And it's nothing that we do. We, we can't do enough good works to earn grace. There's nothing we could offer in payment to buy grace. As it says in our Scripture, we are justified by His grace as a gift. God offers it freely. But He offers it freely to all. See, if, if we really, if we really grasped grace, if we really understood what God has done for us and that we are set free, not only would we rejoice, but we would want to tell others about this great deal. Because it's available to everybody. And that's really our job. As those who have received grace, to share this amazing gift with others, to help others to come to understand that it is available for them as well. It is the grace of God. And it is the only way that we can be made righteous. We stand not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ Himself. 
May we share that grace or the news of that grace with all who need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your amazing love for us. That you, the God of the universe, would come, would live as one of us, would die at the hands of your creation that we might be set free from our sin, that we might be brought back into relationship with you. 
and that you rose again to give us the hope of new life with you. And Lord, as, as we gather to worship you, we lift up some of those on our hearts and minds who are in need of your tender care. Lord, we lift up Shannon, uh, who is in jail. Uh, and Lord, we just pray that you would be present uh, with Shannon right there in her cell. Lord, that somehow uh, you might find a way to break through, to help her to come to, to know you and to trust you. And Lord, that you might help her to turn her life around, that she might uh, be able to, to participate uh, in her family uh, with her daughter, uh, to, to, be, to be the mother that she would like to be and that her daughter needs her to be. And Lord, we just pray that you would be in their midst, that you would be offering mercy and grace and the promise of hope and new life. Lord, we, we lift up all those who are primary caregivers, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them uh, as they care uh, for their family members or uh, whoever is in their care that you would give them the strength that they need, that you would help them to rely on you. And for all those who are in need of caregivers, we just pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would bring them hope and healing. Lord, there are certainly many others on our hearts and minds that we may not have shared publicly this morning. But we lift each and every one to you, trusting that you will be present in each situation, that you will be working for good, for health, for peace, for hope, offering guidance and direction and renewal. And Lord, if you can work through any one of us, we offer ourselves to you that you might fill us with your spirit and send us out to be your presence. And Lord, we also want to give you thanks for the many, many blessings that you pour out upon us each and every day. Help us, Lord, to always be aware of you at work in us and through us and around us. And help us to have the courage to step out, to join you in whatever work you're doing, and to see the amazing transformation that you can make in us and in our world. Lord, we lift all of these prayers to you in the mighty name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The ushers will now come forward. We will continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, your love for us is almost beyond our understanding. You shower us, shower us with so many blessings that are beyond anything that we could ask and certainly more than we deserve. Lord, we ask that you would accept these gifts that we offer back to you. Bless them and multiply them and use them to spread your good news throughout this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join hands for the benediction. Friends, you are beneficiaries of God's grace. You have done nothing to earn it or deserve it, but it is yours. Take it with you and offer it to all those whom you come across, for it is theirs as well, if they'll accept it. So go out into God's world to do His work in Jesus' name. Amen.